Without any further ado, it's my further honor and privilege to invite up um, a woman of God that I'm so excited to hear um, the revelation that she's going to share with us tonight. Um, she just inspires me in every conversation that I have with her, and uh, any time I've heard messages from her, they inspire me, and I just take so much out of it. So why don't you lean in? The edge of your seat is the where you should be, um, encouraging her, because the thing about preaching, when you encourage and engage, the preaching just gets better. So uh, edge of your seat, engaging in this, and uh, why don't we just welcome Renee as she comes. <laughs> Thanks so much for the opportunity to speak tonight. Wow, isn't it a great night to be at church? I'm so excited. Tonight, I've called my message, The Burning Bush and the Bride. We're going to be looking at the life of Moses tonight. And how awesome has the series been on The God Who Speaks? We kicked it off a few weeks ago with Pastor Brent talking about getting expectant to hear the voice of God. And then Pastor Beresford last Sunday, or last Sunday night was talking about the prophetic. Pastor Patricia talked about going into the depths with God. And we've heard amazing testimonies from Nathan and Emma and Tracy about having dreams and visions that God's spoken through, hearing the audible voice of God, seeing God deliver in your situation, seeing the prophetic, hearing the voice of God through others and meeting you in your area of need. And so tonight we continue that series on the God who speaks through Moses' encounter in the burning bush and looking at the bride of Christ, his church, who we stand here today in and God longs to speak through. So tonight I've got five keys for you. Two, to prepare you for a burning bush encounter with God. Two, to propel you into future ministry, wherever you're at tonight. And finally, to stay positioned in the ministry call of God on your life. I remember tonight in worship, the last time I preached, it was about June of last year, and I'd found out three months before that I was pregnant, and I had this memory of Max, my baby now, literally kicking for the first time as I preached. Preached. And tonight, I just remembered that, and I thought the dreams of God, the call of God in some of you is going to start to kick and beat again. The joy of the Holy Spirit is going to come upon you for the call of God. There's going to be refreshing tonight. And so let's jump into Exodus 3, verse 1. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of the Lord. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see the strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am, God. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you stand is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I've heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I've come down to rescue them from the hand of the, Israel, oh, sorry, the Egyptians and bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me and I have seen the way that the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. 
But God said, oh sorry, but Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And then God said, I, I will be with you. Sorry, I know it's a long passage, but what an amazing encounter with God. The first key I want to give you tonight about preparing yourself for an encounter with God is what Moses did in verse 4. He said, here I am, God. We heard that through Pastor Beresford's message last week. The prophet Samuel utters those similar words. Here I am, Lord. Your servant is listening. And tonight, one of the keys of having a burning bush encounter with God is getting expectant, having a heart that says, I'm ready, I'm listening, I'm hearing you, God, I'm standing here and I'm waiting for whatever you'll do in my life. Here I am is not a statement. God doesn't need to know where we literally are location-wise in a room. It's about having a heart attitude of worship and expectancy. It says that Moses took off his shoes because he was standing on holy ground. He had a heart of worship towards God. Get expectant tonight. My second key in preparing you for a burning bush encounter is get curious. And if we can go to that slide, that'd be awesome. Thanks, guys. Verse 4 says that Moses went over to look. You know, it's so easy in our daily life to be going about our day, going through the motions on autopilot, going to our Monday to Friday, nine to five job, or whatever that may look like for you during your week, and just going through the motions of life. And you know, in that time, in the desert of Midian, a burning bush was not an infrequent sight. We may think if we saw a burning bush in New Zealand, we'd be straight on to the fire department and all worried. But then it was hot as hot can be. Things spontaneously lit on fire, not that uncommonly. And, but Moses was curious enough to see that this wasn't just another burning bush. It was a burning bush that did not burn up the plant. And he went over to look at what God was doing. And verse 4 says, when God saw that he went over to look, God called to him, Moses, Moses. When God sees that we get curious, when, he, when we notice what he's doing in our day, he speaks and he speaks powerfully. I'll never forget the first time I prophesied over someone outside the four walls of the church. It was actually with some people from Encounter. I remember when, usually when I prophesy over people, God gives me a full download and I'll speak to them. But at this time I saw this girl, she was maybe 10 or 11 years old. And God said the word to me, soccer. Go and talk to her about soccer. Say the word soccer. And I was like, that's so random, God. I'm so freaked out. This is so not my comfort zone. I don't want to just walk up to a random person and say soccer. That looks really awkward. But I did. Because I went down to look. I thought, God's not going to give me any more until I trust him. So I bowled up to this young girl and said, hey, my name's Renee, how are you going today? And she's kind of looking at me like, what are you getting at? What are you trying to sell me? And I was like, I just really feel to say the word to you, soccer. And there was this really awkward moment. But then God unlocked and unraveled this whole picture about her life. And before the end of it, she was in tears. And we prayed together and God did a, a miraculous and amazing thing that day. But how many of you know if you don't go over to look, if you don't lean in, if you don't get up the front of church sometimes when you've got a stink attitude up the back and you're like, I don't really feel like worshiping here today. If you don't go down to see what God is doing, if you don't notice where he's moving in your day, sometimes those encounters don't happen. And I want to be a people that are positioned and ready for our day of encounter, for our day of our burning bush experience. There's been times where I haven't been that faithful in this area. It was amazing doing the offering declaration tonight. I love the offering declaration. 
And uh, Stu and I have a bit of a running joke. It's a little bit cheeky, but one of the things I do during the offering declaration is I stand with my husband, I stand with the people of Encounter, as I might say, as we receive today's offering, we're believing the Lord for jobs and better jobs, a lawnmower, and the things we need in our day, because I'm really believing God that he's going to do those things. And a couple of weeks ago, I said, God, I need a lawnmower. I really need my husband to mow our jungle of a lawn. And God totally heard me. The very next week, I had the finance for a lawnmower. But then I came to Sunday church and I was doing the offering declaration and I stood there and I was like, God, I haven't even said thank you. How often in our day is God moving and we don't even notice? We've prayed that prayer. We've gone to that cell group meeting. We've had amazing prophecy. And yet a month later, we're like, where are you, God? You're not speaking. Why won't you talk to me? And so I stood during the offering declaration last Sunday and I said, God, I'm so sorry that I that I didn't notice. Thank you, Lord, for financial blessing and breakthrough. Thank you for meeting my need. What is he doing in your day, in your Monday to Friday, nine to five? Whether you're a stay-at-home mom or dad, whether you're going to work, whatever you're doing, God is moving every day. God is speaking every day. But are we listening? Are we getting curious? Are we going over to look? So number one, get expectant. Prepare yourself. Get curious. Watch what God's doing in your day. Number three, to propel ourselves in ministry is know your identity in Christ. Who does he say we are? In Exodus 3 verse 10, Sorry, verse 11, it says, But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And then in the very next chapter, in chapter 4, verse 10, he says, Pardon your servant, Lord, I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. Moses had every excuse in the book and why God couldn't use him. The history around Moses' time was really interesting, you see. He's a part of the Israelite people, the Hebrew people, who were in Egypt and had been in slavery from the time of captivity right through to when he pulled the Israelite people, he led them and delivered them out of Egypt through the desert, a time span of 400 years. Imagine Moses' great-grandfather wouldn't have even known what it felt like not to be a slave. And how many of you know whether you're a slave in the natural or whether you're a captive in your mind, you feel like nothing. You expect abuse. You expect mistreatment. You expect to be poor for the rest of your life. You're in survival mode, in that flight or fight mode, all of the time. Not just when something crazy happens, all of the time. I loved hearing Georgiana and Emma's stories about the amazing ministry they did recently with modern day slaves and how awesome is it that we have people in this place that have a heart to fight that. But Moses was delivered from that. His mother hid him for three months in a period of time where Pharaoh said to the midwives, kill all the newborn babies, especially the boys. Just wipe them out. They were thrown into the river. And Moses was carried down the river Nile in a reed basket and was delivered, was taken into Pharaoh's house by his daughter. And Acts 7.22 says, Moses was educated in all the ways of Egypt. He grew up like a prince. And he was powerful in speech and action. Where did Moses get this idea? After 40 years of living like a prince, to here we are in his, when he's 80, 40 years later, saying, God, I can't do this. I can't speak. I'm slow of speech. I'm not an eloquent man. A man that Stephen describes in Acts as powerful in speech and action. Where did he get that idea? 
Acts 7, 27 says when he went back to see the Israelite people to look at what was going on and an Egyptian brutally attacked one of them and he killed the Egyptian at the attempt to try and rescue his people. Days later, Israelite brothers, people came to him and said, who made you ruler and judge over us? Who, Moses, who made you the ruler? Have we not heard that throughout scripture? Going back to Eve and the serpent in the Bible, right back at the beginning, did God really say you can't eat from the tree, the fruit from the tree of good and evil? To the words of Satan to Jesus in the desert at the beginning of his ministry in Matthew 4, if you're really the son of God, you see, Moses spent 40 years believing he was nothing. He was out in the desert doing nothing, idly tending sheep. Imagine that, going from a prince, living in all the riches, with all the wisdom, with the best teachers, everything he could ever want, to tending sheep. He thought he was a wanted murderer, that is all. He only saw his past weaknesses, his past sin, what he couldn't do. Where did that powerful man of God go? You see, when we turn our eyes onto the accusation of the enemy, onto what people have said about us, maybe negative stuff, gossip, lies. When we turn our eyes onto our past, on all the things we've done wrong, on all the reasons why we can't fulfill the call of God in our life, our perception of ourself changes. Moses had every excuse why God could not use him. But God, I'm 80. But God, I'm slow of speech. But God, I can't go alone. But God, Pharaoh wants to kill me. Why are you sending me to him? And listen to what God said to Moses in Exodus 4.11. He said, who gave human beings their mouths? I feel like God is saying to some of us today, who gave you that singing voice? Who gave you that ability to grow that business? Who gave you those talents? Don't you ever say they're ordinary. I gave them to you. I, the Lord, gave them to you. Sometimes our greatest fears are the very call of God on our lives. In fact, God redeemed Moses' abilities. Although he gave Moses Aaron, his brother, to speak on his behalf, we very rarely see Aaron speak throughout the Old Testament. It was Moses who went to Pharaoh. It was Moses who wrote the book of Deuteronomy. It was Moses who wrote the beautiful creation story. It was Moses who led his people out of captivity. A man who said, I'm slow of speech. I can't talk, I can't communicate. God's promise to us, though, is that we will never go alone. He will prepare us, and he will lead us. Which leads me into my fourth point. What is in your hand tonight? What is in your hand? In Exodus 4, verse 2, God asked Moses that very question. What is in your hand? He said, a staff, a staff, a shepherd's staff a representation of his years of idleness, of his comfort zone, an instrument that he used to guide the sheep, to hook in each individual sheep and examine them, and to bring the herd together. Just a staff, a piece of wood, and nothing. But how many know that in the hands of God, a staff, a simple piece of wood, can part the Red Sea, can draw water from a rock in the desert where there is no water, can be thrown on the ground and a snake can appear. 
For David, it was his slingshot and stones. For Peter, it was his fisherman's net. God wants to use every experience we've had, the good, the bad, the ugly, every experience that we may not want others to know about, every experience that we said, but God, that is so mundane, how could you possibly use that? That nine to five, Monday to Friday job that you may just think, that's my next paycheck. No, God wants to use that for his glory. Romans 8, 28 says, and he brings all things together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Moses was raised in Pharaoh's house. That was no coincidence. He knew where to go. He knew how to speak to a king. What is in your hand tonight? I'll never forget about six years ago, I went on a missions trip with a team from Encounter and had an amazing time. God did some amazingly miraculous things. We went to the Philippines, and I didn't actually know a lot about the Philippines before I went there. I kind of just thought, oh, this will be fun. We'll go on a big trip. We'll see God move. But little did I know that the Philippines is a nation caught up in religion. There's massive religious spirits there. And the main religion of the country is Catholicism. Now, I grew up in the Catholic Church, and never did I think that God would use that to connect me with others. But it was amazing when I was there, as I met young people who were encountering God mightily in this youth camp we ran. They were speaking in tongues for the first time. They're like, wow, God, you want to speak to me personally? I can have a personal relationship with you? You're not dead? You're alive? They were so impacted. And then it came time, the day to go home, to go back to their families, back to their schools, back to their communities. They come from all over to this youth camp. And some of them were really afraid because they're like, but Renee, you don't get it. My dad's a bishop. What is he going to say when I'm praying in tongues? But Renee, you don't get it. I just want to worship God all the time. What it? What's my family going to say? And God managed to bridge cultural barriers, language barriers, and create a connection point because of my past, because of what God had done in me, and my experience of coming out of that faith and into such a dynamic relationship with Jesus. And I said, well, this is what I said to my parents the first time I got a demon cast out of me. And this is what I said to my parents the first time I was so drunk in the Holy Spirit that I couldn't get off the floor and they had to come and pick me up from a meeting. You know what? It's going to be okay. God will look after you. They will forgive you. Yes, it'll be awkward for a little while. But God used my history, a part of my history that I never thought could be something that God would use. He did. He used it as a common point, a common ground, a connection point is the word I'm looking for with these young people in the Philippines. He wants to turn the the mundane in our lives into the miraculous. A simple staff, a piece of wood, turn into a mighty instrument that God would use for Moses in his ministry. Mark 16 verse 17 says, and these signs will accompany those who believe. It talks about casting out demons. It talks about snakes, but holding on to snakes and not being harmed. In John 14 verse 12, Jesus said to the people at the time, but he says to us today, greater things will you do. Greater things will you do than my ministry. And tonight, God wants to say to us that he wants to turn the mundane in our lives You know, sometimes as a stay-at-home mom, I think, oh, I'm just going about my day, I'm going to the shop. But you guys who know, you go out with your baby, how many people come up to you and go, oh, what a cute little baby. And I kind of, you get a bit over it, but God uses it as a ministry point. You know, sometimes I'll be standing with a woman and she'll literally be about to fall apart in the supermarket because she's forgotten her wallet or something's gone wrong. And you can just tell, you can just tell that she's had a really, really hard morning. One of those mornings where nothing's going right, where the kid's screaming, where everything's gone wrong. She's probably been vomited on three times before she got out the door, five outfit changes. And you can stand there. And the amount of times I've said to women, you're an amazing mom. Look at you. You've got a beautiful child. You're an amazing mom. 
And, and using the fact that your mum's as a, as a connection point, God will use whatever you allow him access to in your life. So what is in your hand tonight? It may look so boring and ordinary to you, but God says, no, in my hand, it can part the Red Sea. In my hand, it can see people come out of captivity. What's in your hand tonight? And my fifth point tonight, to stay positioned in the call of God in your life, to stay positioned for burning bush after encounter after burning bush encounter is who is your Aaron? Exodus 4.14 describes how God sent Aaron to Moses, a man who could speak well when he felt like he could not speak. Later in Moses' ministry in Exodus 17, we see a passage that describes an attack of a neighboring tribe, the Amalekites. It shows Moses going up to a high point, up on top of a rock, and he takes his mighty men, Aaron and Hur, as Joshua leads the army, and he can look down on the battle below. He lifts up his staff, that simple piece of wood that meant not much before God got a hold of it. He lifted it up, and as he lifted up his staff, the Israelites gained territory, and the Amalekites began to lose. But as the day went on, Moses' arms got wearier and wearier as he held the staff. And the Bible says that Aaron came on one side of him and her the other. And they lifted up Moses' arms so the staff could stay held high. It could say, stay steady till sunset, the word of God says. And the Israelites had a mighty victory that day. So who is your Aaron tonight? Who is your her? Who is your Joseph? Who is the person who would fight with you and stand shoulder to shoulder? And when you get tired and when you get weary, would literally hold up your arms. The title of my message tonight was The Burning Bush and the Bride. And you may think, okay, Renee, get the burning bush. What does, Mo what does Moses and a bride have to do with each other. I want to tell you a story about my life. And if we can just put that photo up. March 7th, 2014 was one of the happiest days of my life, my wedding day. That photo isn't necessarily the best wedding photo, but what I love about it is it so emulates the emotion I felt on that day. I remember walking up the aisle and my, li my dad literally having to say, Renee, just slow down, graceful walking, graceful walking, because I wanted to run up to that altar and marry my husband. I felt so much joy. I felt I could literally burst on the inside. And I want you to imagine for a moment, right? Now, this is a imaginary story. Stu made sure that I would tell all of you this did not happen on my wedding day. So just imagination time. I want you to imagine for a moment that as I was walking up that aisle, that one of Stu's groomsmen turned to him and said, bro, are you sure you want to marry her? Look at that dress. Look, her she doesn't even have a veil on. Like, why are you marrying this woman? What do you see in her? Now, even thinking about that and someone saying that about a bride makes us all feel a little bit uncomfortable, right? You would never say something about that, something like that about a bride. But how many of us have seen in our generation the name of the bride of Christ dragged through the dirt? So many in our generation, young people, are leaving the church to do this life, to do this Christian walk on their own. And I want to tell you that Jesus sent his Holy Spirit to us, but he sent the church, the vehicle he uses to advance the kingdom of God. The bride of Christ, his church, he's coming back for her, a pure 
and spotless and ecstatic and joyous bride who is so busting to see him that she wants to run down the aisle. That is the church he's coming back for. And today, I want to say, who is your Aaron? The church is the very thing God's given us so that we not only have burning bush encounters and we hear from God again and again and again and again in this place, but so that we have Aaron's so that we have hers, so that we have Joshua's who will stand by our side when we're going through financial difficulty and we're saying, but God, you said you'd provide for me. Where are you now? When we're going through trouble with our health and we're saying, I know you're my healer, but all I can see right now is sickness. It's easy to do it alone when everything's going smoothly, but how many of you know that the Christian walk is amazing, it is adventurous, it is every good thing, but easy is one thing, it's not. And tonight in this place, we are not here by coincidence at 495 Rosebank Road. Look around you tonight. Here sits your Aaron's, your hers, your Joshua's, the people who would stand and fight with you when you can't fight anymore. <laughs> Sorry, God's really on this right now. <laughs> you know, sometimes in life you don't feel like you can run anymore. You don't feel like you've got anything left in you. And it's those errands, it's those hers that say, come on, Renee, you can do this. Come on, remember what happened in that meeting. Remember what God spoke to you a year ago. Remember what happened. Yeah. This is who you really are. You need those errands and those hers that you can text in the moment, in the struggle, in the battle, not afterwards when the victory's won and you can put your little Facebook post about had a hard day, but like it's awesome now. No, in the moment. I remember distinctly being in labor on the 27th of December of last year and texting, getting my husband to text my errands to say, pray this now, in the moment. You know, it's so hard to be raw and vulnerable with people when you're going through stuff, but that is when we need our church the most. The beautiful bride that Jesus is coming back for, a united bride who would stand together, who wouldn't just play church church in this place, but would stand together and say, I'm here for you, man. I'm going to go through that with you. I'll walk it with you. I'll intercede for you. We are not alone. We need each other. And God says tonight, a big part of hearing the voice of God is not just about us and God. Because, you know, sometimes we get it really right. Sometimes we hear so sharp, so accurately, and you're like, whoa, I'm on fire tonight. But sometimes we miss the mark. One of the most painful experiences in my Christian walk in a period of brokenness was choosing the wrong Aaron, choosing a person who was so broken themselves and finding common ground in that. And sometimes it's really easy when you feel broken and down to hang out with other broken and down people because they tell you exactly what you want to hear, not the truth. The truth is, Renee, that's not the best decision to make. Come on, Renee, you know better than that. I actually don't think you're on the money here. I don't think that's God. And just like Moses, 40 years of isolation out with a sheep, he could think whatever he wanted to, all that accusation saying you're nothing. They're never going to see you as a ruler and a judge. Who do you think you are? No wonder he doubted himself. If I can get a keyboardist or just have some really light worship music in the background, and we're just going to pray for some people tonight. God sent Moses and Aaron, even though maybe he didn't need to. God could have said, harden up, Moses. Just go and talk to Pharaoh yourself. Stop being such a wuss. No, he said, I'll send you, Aaron. I'll send you people to go with you, to stand by you, to fight for you. 
And when you're weak, Aaron will be strong. Tonight in this place, there are some people that need Aaron's and hers and Joshua's. There are some people that need Moses's tonight. As I was preparing this message, this scripture, this verse literally popped out at me and I feel like there is a number of people tonight that need to hear this. In Exodus 4, verse 19, God said to Moses, go back to Egypt. Go again, Moses. For all those who wanted you killed are dead. They are dead tonight. And God says to some of you tonight, the accusation, the lies, the past, it's all gone. You are not disqualified. It's time to go back to Egypt. It's time to go again. It's time to get out of our comfort zone and be prepared to run again with God. And for some of you tonight, you've never thought about the ministry call of God in your life. For some of you tonight, you've had prophecy after prophecy after prophecy after prophecy. And you've said like Moses tonight, but God, I'm 80. But God, I can't speak. I can't preach. But God, I could never be on the worship team. But God, I'm a cleaner. How could could you possibly use me? I can think of a million ways God could use a cleaner. I'll never forget, I, I work at a hospital before I went on maternity leave, and there's this one cleaner. And as you walk in down the corridor at 6.30 every morning, she's singing, I got that joy, 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 joy down in my heart. She sings worship songs out loud in front of everyone, in front of the doctors, in front of the patients. She praises God as she mops the floor. And the amount of times that I'm walking into work going, oh God, another day, I'll just get me to Friday, please, Lord. And I see this woman and I'm like, why do I have such a bad attitude? God, you're gonna move today. God, you're gonna see people healed today. God, we're gonna speak into people's lives today. People are gonna be changed today. God can use you no matter what your job is, no matter whether you can speak or not, no matter what your singing voice is like, no matter how smart you are, no matter how old you are, no matter how young you are, the amount of times he uses my baby boy, an 11 month old, as a ministry key to minister to people. So tonight, God says to us, go back to Egypt. Get out of your comfort zone. He says, get prepared. I want to speak to you tonight. He says, get curious. Watch what I will do in your day. Watch what I will do through you. He says, know who I say you are. Not the past, not those people who hated you, not those people who saw you in that season of sin. No, who do I say you are today? He says, what's in your hand? Will you give it to me? Will you let me use it? And will you let me send you an Aaron, a truth speaker, a prophet, a person who will pick you up when you don't want to run anymore? A person who will stand with you when you're scared to go to the pharaohs of this world and will hold your hand and literally go, you know what, you can do it. It's going to be okay. God is calling us tonight to go deeper. And I want to tell you, encounter that summer is often a time where we kick back and hit the beach and do a lot of chillaxing. But this summer, I would challenge you to dream again with God. What would He say that 2019 is for you? It is no coincidence that we are here. We are gonna have an amazing 2019 in this place. But how many of you know that in order for expansion to happen, in order for growth to happen, our hearts need to grow first? I can't wait to see Sunday nights packed full of people, to literally have to line up to get in the door, to have to park all the way up Rosebank Road and walk along because there's so many people in this place. I can't wait till the day that at 6 p.m. we're all here like, let's go, let's praise God. So tonight, I want to encourage those of you who have felt like 
maybe I can't go again. Who am I, God, that you should send me? Like Moses. I want to pray for you guys tonight. Because God wants to stir up the gift again in you. So there's a few groups of people I want to pray for tonight. And I want to tell you that no one is going to miss out on this place. There's a few things that we're going to do here tonight. The first one is we have some pens and paper. And there are five questions. If we can just put that slide up now. The five points I've talked about tonight. And if you don't feel to come up on this altar call, I know it'll be so easy to go and get some dumplings or do something else or have a chat. But I encourage you. Stay for just five or ten minutes and say to God, God, what would you say to me tonight? What do you want to speak into my heart? What is my 2019 to look like? And I want to encourage you to write it down. Write it down. And when the going gets tough in January and we're all back at work and the beach days are over and it starts raining, you can look at that and go, that's what God said. Because you know, you might not remember Sunday the 9th of December 2018 or what Renee said, but what God directly spoke into your spirit, you will remember. Moments like this in church have literally changed my life. But I want to invite some people up here tonight as well. And I want to pray for those of you who need a refreshing touch upon the gift of God in your life. Maybe you've said, but God, I can't go again. I'm exhausted. Maybe you've said, God, I don't even know what the call of God of my life is. And maybe you've said, I once run, and I've been out in the desert, and I've been a shepherd, and I don't know if I can go again. I don't know if I can go back to Egypt and face the things I once had to face. I have every reason, Renee, you don't know tonight what I've done or where I've been. I want to tell you that God does. And he says tonight, go back to Egypt, go again. So for those of you who want prayer tonight, I just want to invite you up. Love to pray for you. Love to lay hands on you and stir up the gift. Why don't you move now? I'm not going to drag this out. I just encourage you to come. Matt's just going to put some pens and stuff up here for those of you who want to write. Why don't you come Those of you who would say, God, you've used me once, but I'm exhausted. You've used me once. I know that I need to go again, but I don't know how I'm going to do it. Those of you who would say, I don't know what the next step is. What's in my hand? How could you possibly use me tonight? Why don't you come? Thank you, Father God. Thank you for these amazing people. Thank you that, God, tonight you want to stir up destiny upon them. Thank you that tonight their accusers are gone. Thank you that tonight all sin, every past thing, everything that they thought has disqualified and would stop them from fulfilling the call of God on their life is gone. Thank you that God, 2019 is a season to run. It's a recommissioning. It's a re-summoning of those who have once said, God, here I am, use me. But maybe have just gotten a little bit worn out in the process or maybe have gone a little bit off track. God says to you tonight, go again. I will go with you. I will prepare you. I will put the words in your mouth. You will not be left alone. You will not be hurt like the last time. You are not a failure. Know that I'm with you. Know that I'm with you. Thank you, Father God, for tonight. Holy Spirit, I thank you for your presence here. I thank you that you are going to move. I thank you that you are speaking to each one even now. Holy Spirit, stir up the gift of God on the inside of each man and woman here. I declare that we would run again. 
Shirabu Surya Shukurandrabasidya Shurandrabasai Moa Moa more greater levels greater levels for you emma greater levels mm -hmm. father god right now stir